Amen. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. We've talked about this before concerning how this is a prediction of the establishment of the kingdom of God. Uh, In the New Testament, the kingdom is called the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's called uh, the kingdom of God's dear son. It's called just the kingdom. Those are different ways of referring to the kingdom. Now, besides this verse here, what verses could you take a person to who believes that the kingdom is not on earth yet, but will be established when Jesus returns. How would you prove that the kingdom is already in existence? Revelation 1.5, yeah, that, that would be one to go to. Made us uh, uh, kings, uh, our kingdom of priests, 5 and verse 6. Kings or kingdom, depending on the translation you might have, of priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. That would be a good one to go to. Also in the same chapter, verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom. And patience of Jesus Christ was on the Isle of Patmos. was called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here, John is saying, I'm in the kingdom. It had to be in existence for him to be in it. So that is... uh, Uh, proof of the existence of the kingdom at that time. Any other passages? So Mark 1, uh, what verse is that? 15. Saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. (coughs) Excuse me. So Jesus is making it very clear the kingdom is close, it's at hand. That's the same thing he's saying there in Mark 9 and verse 1. There's some of you who aren't going to die until you see the kingdom established. So that would be a good uh, kingdom verse to take them to, to show that Jesus taught in his life that it was uh, at hand, something very close. How about Colossians 1 and verse 13? He's writing, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. And conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. 
the us there is, of course, referring to the Christians he's writing to. The saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Chapter 1 and verse 2. So, those saints and faithful brethren have been delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So, I think that's a very uh, powerful verse uh, to take someone to. And there's, there's several others. We're going to move on. But there's several others, and it would be good to have them uh, on a piece of paper or, or something in, in the cover of your Bible. If you take notes, just write, the kingdom is here, or something like that, and write down the verses that show some of the ones we've cited tonight, that show that the kingdom is already here. And that way, if you get into a discussion with someone who believes that the kingdom is not here yet, you can just take them to those passages and say, well, here's, here's what the Bible says. Going on in Mark 9, uh, we see the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, Peter, James, and John are led away on a high mountain. He's transfigured before them. We talked about them this happening um, when we had class last two weeks ago. He began to uh, radiate the glory of God. Uh, His uh, clothes became exceedingly white like snow, uh, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. In other words, this is a supernatural uh, glow, uh, a radiance that's taking place. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Uh, Peter answered and said, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say because he was greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. What is the point of this? Why did Mark record this miracle? What is the point that, that's trying to be conveyed here? So the, the point that, you, that I hear you saying is that what, what, why this is recorded is to show the superiority of Jesus over uh, Moses and Elijah, basically. And uh, that would be the point. He is the one that uh, we are to listen to and we are to hear him. If I want to be saved, I'm not going to go and look up what Elijah said about it. I'm not going to go look up and see what Moses said about it. In other words, I'm not going to go to the Old Testament and say, what do I need to do to be saved? And try to abide by their teachings because their teachings were for that period of time and not for us. Why would I bypass the Son of God and go to these men? They were great men. They were men of God. But Jesus is the Son of God. And he said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Moses never said that. Elijah never said that. No other man could ever say that but Jesus. 
So we, we see this, this is recorded to let us know that no matter how great men may be, they're not as great as the Son of God. And there have not been anyone since the time of Christ as great a men as they may have been that is as great as Jesus. We're to listen to him. So if I'm, I'm to listen to Jesus and what Jesus says has more authority and more weight than what Elijah said, than Moses said, that means that anyone since Jesus uh, if they're not an inspired writer like Paul or Peter or the other writers of the New Testament, <coughs> if they're just ordinary men, I'm not to exalt them. I'm not to say I'm going to listen. I'm going to be loyal to to John Wesley or Martin Luther or Alexander Campbell or any man, and and say that is where my authority comes from, because. Uh, we, we are to listen to Jesus. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. As Hebrews chapter 1 introduces Jesus as being the creator of the worlds, he purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of, of the majesty on high. Well, that's the greatest credentials you could come up with. I mean, you can't have greater credentials than that. And so Jesus is the one that we are to listen to. <clears throat> We're to hear him. Verse 8, suddenly, uh, excuse me, verse 9. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded that they should tell no one these things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. There were certain things that were revealed that were not to be disclosed publicly until after Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, here again, Jesus is emphasizing he's rising from the dead. He'd already told them that they're going that he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be mistreated, he's going to be killed, and he's going to rise again. So he's reemphasizing the fact that he is going to be killed and rise again. Right. Right. That's right. That they had to, they had to realize that the law and the prophets was still in place till Jesus died, like you said, and so. Right. <coughs> right. Plus, spreading something like this around would really uh, infuriate the religious leaders and cause all kinds of problems with them. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a plan there. So in verse 10, so they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. See, they, they didn't understand that. What does it mean, rising from the dead? They could not understand that. Verse 11, and they ask him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Now, we have further evidence of who Elijah is in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse uh, 13 and 14. Jesus says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. So John, the forerunner to Christ, was the Elijah that was to come. Now, the Jews had a, a misunderstanding of that, and they thought literal Elijah was going to come. You, 
You remember when we read those passages about the death of Christ on the cross and Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli sounds like Elijah. And so the people standing around said, he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah will come down and take him off the cross. They thought Elijah was literally going to return. Well, it's because like many other passages, they misunderstood those passages. If you look at Malachi, Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. <coughs> <coughs> Some 430 years before the birth of Jesus. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, and whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The messenger who will prepare the way. That goes along with Isaiah 40 and verse 3. The purpose of, of, of John was to be a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. He was to prepare Israel for the coming of Jesus. Now look at chapter 4, Malachi 4. And verse 4. Malachi 4 and verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So this is talking about the coming of John, and he says John is going to be Elijah the prophet. Excuse me, not literal Elijah, but he's going to come in the, the attitude and the disposition of Elijah. He's going to be a prophet like Elijah. And he's going to come and he is going to bring restoration and restore. That's what he did. He got the people ready for the coming of the Messiah. That's what his baptism was for, to prepare people. They, they were to repent of their sins and be baptized and be ready for the Messiah when he comes on the scene. And you go back to Mark chapter 9, verse 13, I say to you that Elijah has also come. Now that's talking about John. They did to him whatever they wished as it is written of him. What did they do to John? What? Killed him. Typical response to the prophets. That's pretty much... How they treated the prophets. The prophets that spoke the truth, rebuked their immorality, rebuked their sin. They were either severely persecuted or killed, and sometimes both. And so they did to him whatever they wished. So here you see uh, the response of people to, uh, of Herod to uh, John's preaching. Beginning in verse 14, verses 14 through 29, you... Uh, see a demon possessed boy having this demon cast out of him there are many great lessons in this uh, narrative here and we had come uh, and he came to his disciples he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them immediately when they saw him all the people were greatly amazed running to him and greeted him and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down and foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. So here's a situation where a... a a boy, a, a young man's a demon possession could not be taken care of by the disciples. Verse 19, he answered and said to him, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him uh, to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground 
and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So this is a very severe um, type of demon possession that's causing all kinds of convulsions in this young man, causing him to wallow on the ground and to foam uh, at the mouth. Verse 21. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus answered, or excuse me, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately his father cried, of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now keep that in mind, we're going to go back to it. When Jesus saw the people, came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, <clears throat> convulsed him, came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. When he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he answered and said to him, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, let's go back to what the, the father said as, as Jesus says in verse 23. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And here's the response of the father. The father with tears cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What do you suppose he was saying when he said, I believe, help my unbelief? He had doubts. What do you think might have uh, contributed to the doubts? I think that could have been some. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So this is a helpless situation, and, 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 and the father is evidently distraught. And he, he, he cried out with uh, tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And what that, what that means is I believe that this can, this can uh, be cured, that my son's demon can be uh, taken care of. But I have some doubts about it. I believe, but it, my faith isn't 100%. And um, do we not face that sometimes in our own life? When it comes to, of course, not something that's exactly like this, but something else. Especially when it comes to our trust in God. And we've talked about faith and the component parts of faith. Uh, Sunday, and part of one of those component parts is trust. Trusting in God, trusting His promises. I believe, Lord, that you will take care of me no matter what, but I'm going to worry about it. I'm going to fret over it. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, have sleepless nights over it. Right. And so here's the thing for me, like I believe maybe I believe you can do it. But I don't know if that's what you're gonna to choose to do. Right.
Right. Exactly. And I think probably verse 19 might include the disciples. Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. So, uh, you know, whatever deficiency they had in trying to do this uh, situation and solving this uh, demon possession, Jesus was the only solution. It goes back to what we've looked at before in the book of Mark, where here's a hopeless situation. Jesus is the only solution to the hopeless situation. And we're coming across it again here. And notice the man is looking to um, Jesus for help. Help my unbelief. You're the only one that can help my unbelief. You're the only one that can help this situation. You know, I'm, it's not the same thing, but the concept of dealing with the personal struggles that we face. When you look at um, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, Paul talks about the struggle with sin. His warring that goes on within him, his struggle with sin. Well, what does he say in verse 24 in Romans chapter 7? O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he's saying there, I'm in a hopeless situation without Christ. And I believe that this man here is realizing that. I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, he, this has been going on for years. From childhood, look at verse 21. How long has this been happening to him? He said, from a childhood. So this is not something that has happened within the past few months. This is something he's been living with for a long time. And now the disciples, they weren't able to do it. And the only hope, the only last one that will not fail you is Jesus. Here's another point here. Disciples of Jesus will fail. That's why we shouldn't put trust in disciples of Jesus ultimately. Disciples of Jesus will fail. They have weaknesses. We all do. Weaknesses, we fall short. We don't live up to what we should live up to. Jesus will never fail. He never will. And so he's turning to the one, the only one that can ultimately help him. And so I think there's a lesson there for us to, to see that um, we can, we can uh, only turn to Jesus who without fail can help us in any dire situation. Even the best among us as far as disciples, as far as the followers of Christ will not be able to do certain things and will fall short because um, not being prepared, not being ready for the situation. Jesus will never be caught off guard. He will always be prepared. So he cast him out. And they ask in verse 28 and 29, <clears throat> why could we not cast it out? And he said, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So it seems to indicate there might have been different types of demon possession that did di different things uh, to people. There's nothing, the, this, this boy was mute. He didn't speak. Other demons would speak. I know who you are. You're the, you're the Holy One of Israel. And Jesus would cast them out, tell them to be silent, cast them out. Uh, there was the, the legion of demons in that one man who gave him supernatural strength. He could not be bound by fetters, by chains. He would break them. Here, this caused this man to, to, be, uh, uh, to have convulsions and to foam at the mouth. And, and so there may have been different uh, types, intensities of demon possession. There's just a lot about that we don't know. 
But we do know that Jesus was the only solution. Jesus was the only solution. Right. I think so. I think there, there is something there, and prayer and fasting all, almost always goes together in the Bible. I think it's um, a fervency of prayer that foregoes eating and, and says, I don't want to eat right now. I am so focused on, on God and praying to him and speaking to him that we, we really, I mean, I personally don't do as I ought to do. And um, something we should think about, the intensity of prayer, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Fervent. That's an intensity. And fasting goes along with that. You forego that to, to focus on that. And so there is a power there that's available to, to help us get through these difficult things. And, of course, in that miraculous context, it was something that they evidently did not factor in to their casting out of demons, especially with this one. This kind, notice what Jesus said, this kind so it seems to indicate there's different kinds of demon possession. This kind comes out with nothing but prayer and fasting. So there's different types uh, of demon possession that went on. Very interesting study. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Very interesting study. Very good points. Exactly. There was a crying out that went, that, that came forth there in verse 26. Very, very interesting points that can be drawn from verses 14 through 29. You look at verses 30 through 32. Jesus, a second time, is now going to tell them what's going to happen at Jerusalem. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Why do you think they were afraid to ask him? They were afraid to ask him, what happened the last time that Peter spoke up in, uh, in chapter 8? He called him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Peter rebuked Jesus, said, no, you, you're, this isn't going to happen. But then he turned around and looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan. So they said, that we don't, we don't want to go through that again. Uh, they keep their keep their mouth shut, even though they don't understand. It's like, okay, I don't want to. I don't want to get what Peter got. But he, this is saying what the Old Testament said would happen. But again, based upon a misunderstanding, bad theology of the scribes and the rabbis that said that the Messiah would not go through this. And 
And for him to say, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be killed and rise again the third day, they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. So here's the second time in which they, this is, is going to be brought up. Uh, in Mark, there's going to be a third time in Mark chapter 10. So he gave them pretty adequate warning. Here's what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And when it happened, they still didn't get it. Uh, it they still didn't understand. It, it didn't fit with uh, what they thought he should be doing, what, what the Messiah should be doing. In verses 33 through 37 is another, another indicator they didn't get it as well. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he had, was in the house, he asked them, what is it that you disputed about or disputed among yourself on the road? What was it that you disputed among yourself on the road? Verse 34, and they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So when they go to Capernaum, they're in the house there. He said, what were y'all talking about out there? <coughs> they kept silent. They didn't want to bring it up. Because they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. They're still thinking in terms of uh, an earthly empire. Who would be the greatest in the kingdom? And so he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If you desire to be first, you shall be last of all and servant of all. If you want to be exalted, you've got to be humble. You've got to humble yourself. There's got to be humility there. And that humility shows greatness. And then he took a little child. It's very interesting. You study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus' relationship with little children. He loved little children. And it seemed to be that little children loved to be around him. And um, little children seem to have a sense about who's a good person and who's not as far as who they would like to be around. So they, they knew Jesus was a good person. He took a little child and set it in the midst, and he said to them, we had taken him in his arms. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now what is verse 37 saying? Receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Humble as a child, when you take into account the other, to use a child as an example of humility, you've got to become like a little child to be converted. You've got to be converted like a little child. You've got to have that, that, those childlike qualities to, to receive the blessings of salvation and all that. Now, what's some of those childlike qualities that a person has to have? Forgiving attitude. Faith. Faith. Love. Love. Faith. Dependence. Obedience. Obedience. Eager to learn. Those things. And so he's, that's what he's saying here. And now verse 37, it's a shame that this verse here is taken and twisted to... to refer to infant baptism or, or christening as it is sometimes called. And they'll cite verses like this. 
You receive one of these little children in my name receives me. And this verse will be cited to try to, to uh, go along with their ritual of christening a baby or baptizing, sprinkling water on a baby. And so um, <clears throat> there's no way on earth that that verse is saying anything like that. Jesus didn't have any water in his hand. He wasn't baptizing the child, wasn't doing anything of that nature. And so he was giving a, uh, uh, the example of a child as someone that is to receive Christ. And when you receive Christ, you receive him who sent me. And so that receive one, it's interesting that word receive in the Greek has reference to um, taking care of. To take care of. You receive a child, little child, you take care of. In my name, that is by, by my authority, you receive me. So that there's also the concept here of taking care of the little children in the name of Christ, by the authority of Christ. You receive me. Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. So there is that acceptance of the little children, uh, the, the, the concept of loving and taking care of little children, and also, along with that, the attitude of being like a little child. You got to be humble. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Now think about this in this society. Very much a patriarchal type society. That Jesus would take a little child and saying, taking care of this little child, receiving this little child in my name, you receive me and you receive God. The humbleness, the, the, the humble service uh, of doing something like this. Which in the minds of so many in that culture and today, to be a real man you got to go out and shed blood. you got to go out and do these uh, manly things. And he says, this humble service makes you great in the kingdom of heaven. You don't, you don't have to, to go out and, and conquer uh, like a warrior. But this humble service that you engage in will cause you to be uh, first cause you to be exalted in God's scheme of things so again that is very much um, against the concepts of what the kingdom should be humble service makes you great the great warriors of an army are served by servants in an, in a, an earthly empire they had servants that would tend to their armor tend to their sword help uh, put on their armor and everything. They had servants, especially if they were a high-ranking official. They had servants under them serving them. And Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, you want to be great, you be a humble servant. You be humble and you serve. That will make you great. That's the very opposite of the concept of an earthly empire. So next week, uh, Lord willing, we'll be finishing up Mark chapter 9 as we continue our study through the book of Mark.